that India now is the fourth country trying to stick some craft on the moon. They have essentially been orbiting, they're in pre-landing orbit of uh, the, the moon's south pole. Uh, this is after Russia crashed their craft and have failed uh, in their first lunar mission in 47 years, having smashed into the moon itself. Ha ha, take that, Putin. Well, apparently China, uh, uh, India, is prepared to do a little bit better and maybe the very first co uh, country to be able to land a craft on the south pole. It remains an unknown region. It's coveted, in fact, as uh, the next best place to be on the moon, uh, given that it may have frozen water, which could potentially serve as a reservoir for fuel, oxygen and drinking water, which would make it theoretically possible to sustain human life. So are India going to be the country that uh, manages to do this great lunar breakthrough? Let's speak now to Andy Lyne, astronomer and space expert. Andy, I love all things moon. Um, disclaimer, my granddad actually was uh, one of the geologists who very first uh, analysed the rocks that were brought back from that very first moon landing. So I have personal familial investment in this. Um, do you hope that India makes it and manages to land at the South Pole? Hi, Alex. Wow, that's brilliant. Uh, your father, fantastic. Yes, I hope they do do it. I mean, India uh, have got a quite an exciting space program and have done for many years through ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization, which is a fabulous organization for developing technologies ac ac across the board of the communities as well, bringing all sorts of people together. Uh, their first attempt at landing something on the moon with Chandrayaan 2 failed, sadly. Um, that hit the moon with far too much force to land and therefore this mission essentially replaces that lander, the old Vikram lander, um, to try and get down there. And it is an important project. Um, the Russians have failed trying to get to the same area. It's actually not easy to land something on the South Polar region. No one has landed at polar regions before planetary bodies, save for a polar lander on Mars, and that was the second attempt to do that. So it is actually difficult because you've got to place yourself in a very different orbit, which makes things difficult. But it looks good for tomorrow afternoon's landing at the moment. They're putting themselves in a near circular orbit to actually do it. And their research that they're going to come from the South Polar region is going to be absolutely vital, not just to scientists in general, but also to India, of course, for, for its economy, for future operations, and of course for the Artemis project, which of course is going to be sending humans to the South Polar region. I mean, the, the, it, it says in the copy here that they, if they did land on the South Pole, they might be sniffing around for some frozen water, fuel reserves, all these bits and bobs that may enable mm. us one day to send people to the moon and perhaps for a long period of time. There are a few people I can uh, put in a spaceship and send to the moon tomorrow, I'll tell you that much, Andy. <laughs> uh, how important is it, do you reckon, that it's a country like India that has this breakthrough and it isn't China or it isn't Russia? And, you know, how likely are India to share their information and their findings when it comes to what they find if they do make it tomorrow? That's a good question you raised there, but you also have to remember that countries like India and including China, interesting enough, do work on an international basis with nations around the world. I mean, China's just released their lunar samples available for international study if they wanted to, so that which they brought back some time ago. And that's from the far side of the moon, stuff we haven't seen before. Uh, so India will share their scientific information there, but there's, it's a double-edged sword, this is. They'll share the scientific information, that's fine, and everybody's going to play along with that. At the same time, India, from a personal point of view, will be looking at it for all the possibility of resource material there for sending humans to there or what mineral resources there, rare earth metals, which, which are getting too deep inside our own planet now, we can't get them out. It's not going to be cost effective. It would be cost of, more cost effective to obtain them from the moon or from the asteroids. So they're looking at it from that point of view as well, future prospecting. Um, but it'll be a, if they can find water ice there, that'll be an enormous breakthrough because as you correctly said, to, to survive on the moon, you need to have local resources if possible. Water ice would be brilliant. You've got the hydrogen and oxygen of the water, which you can use for fuel. You can actually breathe the, the oxygen anyway, so that would be absolutely vital. And, of course, you could use the water. So th it's going to be absolutely critical. The fact it's going to be India that's done it, that's absolutely great. I think it's fantastic, especially for India itself, because although we're, we're used to the United States, European Space Agency and China doing a lot of these things, it's much nicer to have some other nations getting involved as well, because space research is an international endeavour and it should always be an international endeavour because it's the only way as a species we're ever going to get anywhere I think.
Oh, I love a bit of this uh, international endeavours and space research. Do you know, my mate Tony always says how disappointed he is by the International Space Station, which he says is about the distance from Earth of, say, London to Birmingham or London to Manchester or something, and then the moon is about 100,000 miles away, and it does sort of put things in context of what we managed to do with the technology of a calculator back in the 60s. Now, talking about uh, previous efforts to uh, do <laughs> things in space, 1983, two scientists from Japan sent a radio message towards a star 16.7 light years away and experts are now hoping that they might get a reply today if there are aliens on nearby planets this is brilliant do you think we are going to get a message back uh, I'd be, I think we'd be lucky if we did. It's interesting. I mean, the two scientists who did it apparently were slightly inebriated when <laughs> they had the idea of doing it. <laughs> but having said that, they did it scientifically, which is what scientists do when they're inebriated. They do amazing things. So they actually sent a coded message out there, a mathematical message out, talking about the evolution of Earth in a very basic way. Um, it took 16.7 years for the message to have arrived around Altair. And of course, therefore, it's going to take 16.7 years for a mess any return message to come back to us. So they've suggested that now would be the good time to start listing from any planetary signal that's transmitted there for, for to see if we get a reply. I think that's really quite interesting. Um, I have to say, however, we've been broadcasting out into space for a lot longer than that anyway. This show's going out into space and in 16.7 years time, the signals will actually pass Altair as well. And if they've got the equipment there, they'd be able to pick it up. So hello, everybody. At Altair. So we've been doing it for a while and we still haven't picked the messages up from extraterrestrials, which I think is quite interesting that we haven't picked a signal up as yet from anywhere. It